My name is Jim Sweet. I'm the chair of the history department here, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce the lecturer tonight. Um, this is the Harvey Goldberg Memorial Lecture, and it, I, I feel like it's incumbent that I, that I take the opportunity to, for those of you who don't know who Harvey Goldberg was, to at least um, say a few words about Goldberg. Um, Harvey Goldberg began his career here at the University of Madison, University of Wisconsin Madison, in the early 1940s um, as a student. He was an undergraduate student here. Uh, he stayed on afterwards to pursue a PhD in French history and began his teaching career at Oberlin College and then went to Ohio State University after that. But he returned to Madison in 1963. Goldberg quickly outgrew the, the auditoriums where he was giving lectures initially and actually wound up teaching most of his largest lecture courses in the old Ag Hall, I mean, where there were 500 students and overflow actually out the, out the doors waiting to hear his lectures. Um, so people were sneaking in even though they weren't receiving credit for the courses. It's a different, different world than many of you undergraduates and students today probably, I mean, certainly even in my own experience. So it, was a, it was a different, uh, a different time. <laughs> um, but after listening with the sort of rapt attention that you don't see oftentimes uh, in lectures today, um, these classes would go beyond their allotted time and Goldberg's classes, and this does still happen here at UW-Madison in a way that I've not experienced in other places, and I've had a few jobs before I came here, um, but it only happens at the end of semesters now where people will actually clap for the professor, but after each of Goldberg's lectures, people would perform like this. So just to give you an idea of the kind of lecture he was, it was performance um, in a way that I don't think many of us who, who practice this craft um, oftentimes think about in our daily routine today. Um, there are a few exceptions, one of them is sitting here, but um, um, it, it's, it's a way of saying that um, you know, thinking about Harvey Goldberg is to think about a, a, a different way of teaching, um, and I would challenge all of you to think in those terms. Um, these, these lectures were meticulously crafted performances, as I mentioned earlier, um, but I also want to stress that they were based on deeply, deeply researched um, work. And, in a, in a way, Harvey dedicated his career to crafting these performances and making these lectures his body of work. And so their impact um, spread well beyond just the classroom. They, they, you know, we have a fleet of, of former Goldberg students who uh, are so dedicated to his legacy, both in their teaching but also in the rigor of their research. Uh, and Bob, Bob Poland is one of those people. Uh, so he inspired his, his students not only in terms of the practice of the craft of lecturing and research, but perhaps more, um, more durably he inspired his students to engage actively in the social issues of the day. So um, Harvey Goldberg was the, sort of the epitome of the teacher social activist, and I think that that's, that strand of, of Goldberg's legacy is also enduring um, to the present day. So, I won't say too much more about Goldberg. Uh, what I will say is that there is something providential about the circumstances that brought our Goldberg lecture here tonight. Um, I wrote to Bob in April after seeing his name among our alums and friends who had donated to the Harvey Goldberg Fund. Um, and as, as is my habit, I try to get to know a little bit about our alums. And when I saw Bob's profile at the UMass website and then a video of one of his lectures on on YouTube, it was a lecture that he gave at the New School, which is where he received his PhD. Um, I thought to myself two things. One was, you know, this guy is not only a scholar activist in the, in the vein of Harvey Goldberg, but he, he has the sort of charismatic appeal that Goldberg seemed to have had for his own students. Um, and I'm embarrassing him now, but I told him this when I wrote to him. And then, yeah, I'm trying hard. I'm gonna make it hard for you. Uh, so I asked my colleagues who were um, um, the, di the director of the Goldberg um, project here along with the faculty who are, who are in charge of that, uh, the Goldberg Center, and said, look, you know, can, can we invite um, Bob Poland to give the Goldberg lecture this year? And they enthusiastically agreed. Um, then when I invited Bob, this is what he wrote to me. And it was, again, the, this is the providential part of it. He says, as it happens, and this is, the, this is his email response saying, absolutely, I will do it. He says, as it happens, I had two Harvey Goldberg experiences just this past week. First, I was speaking to my wife about my own lecturing in my intro to macroeconomics course for 350 students, so um, very similar. 
I was confessing to her that I can never seem to get close to Harvey's amazing standard as a knockout, mesmerizing lecturer, tried though I have been doing for more than 30 years. Second, we have a small apartment outside of DC that I haven't be, hadn't been to for a while. When I went back in this past week, I found my copy of Harvey's collected le lectures. So now to receive the invitation in the same week, the stars are obviously aligned for my Harvey connection. Uh, so this is all meant to be. It's, it's, it's actually, a, 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 I think, a very nice moment. So now I'm transitioning to my introduction to Bob. Uh, Bob Poland is a distinguished professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he's also director and principally director of, of the Political Economy Research Institute, or PERI, speaking of acronyms. Uh, Trained first as a historian at UW-Madison, he received his bachelor's degree in 1972 before becoming a roofer, a journalist, a consultant, and even the CEO of, a, of an NBA basketball team. He could have made a career of any of these, but instead he became an economist. The explanation for which he gave in eloquent detail this afternoon for a group of our students, undergraduates and graduates alike. Um, at core, Bob is an economist who has always been ahead of the curve. I mean, I think he, sees, he calls himself heterodox. It's a this gr small group of, of economists who uh, lie outside the sort of neoclassical version that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, but what he has done throughout his career is shape economic policy and particularly the social policy responses to that. Um, so he's been at, at center, the sort of kind, the same kind of creative, engaged, activist scholar, very much in the, in the uh, legacy of Harvey Goldberg. Um, in terms of actually what he's done, he's been a consultant for the U.S. Department of Energy and International Labor Organ and the ILO, the International Labor Organization. Um, he's been a leader in in the the movement for a living wage in the U.S. Um, he's been a United Nations consultant on poverty reduction and job creation in, in Africa, particularly in Kenya, in South Africa, and Ghana. These are areas that are of great importance to me. So we've, we've been having nice conversations all day about things ranging from the Washington bullets, wizards, to, um, to economic policy in South Africa. It's, it's a lot of fun to be with Bob. Uh, he's presently a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the European Commission Project on Financialization, Economy, Society, and Sustainable Development. And his most recent project, uh, which we're going to hear about here tonight, is on gr the green energy movement and putting people back to work as, as a result of this. You can see the title here, the U.S. Green Energy Transformation. Uh, this is part of a, a much larger project. Some of you have probably seen, I sent around the, um, the links to the Boston Review um, forum, which outlines a very small portion of this project. It's, it's uh, the larger project you can find online at the Perry website. It's been published. It's a 400-page book. Um, as Bob said, it's a long sort of slog to let the pieces of this out, but he's dedicated to it and will spend time doing this for the next four years, as well as a broader global study, which um, is due to be released when? Later this month, Later this month um, which sort of echoes many of the things we'll hear about here tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Bob Poland. Yeah. Glad you remembered. I wouldn't <laughs> sing. Um, is this good? Well, thank you very, very much for that introduction. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess I also just have to say a, a couple things about being here and about Harvey Goldberg. Uh, you prob I don't know how, who you've had as the previous speakers, but uh, uh, Harvey Goldberg is somebody who's had, had a huge influence on my life, uh, starting from when I uh, was, I guess, a sophomore here in 1970, uh, right up until today. So it's, it's true when I was talking uh, about Harvey with my wife and do pretty often. Um, and it wasn't, I, I want to say the, um, my experience here, Harvey was amazing, but it wasn't just Harvey. It was the whole uh, history department. I was a history major. And at the time then, as I understand, I know now, it was a fantastic uh, institution. And I hope uh, those of you who are here and experience it now uh, recognize how great it is and how important it is. Um, I told the, the people, um, the, the students that we had lunch with this, uh, this afternoon, after I finished college and I had various jobs, including 
uh, journalism for a while, and I was interviewed for one job, and they said, oh, you're a history major, so what did you get out of that? And I said, well, I, at Wisconsin as a history major, um, I learned to respect ideas. And um, I don't know if he was impressed or not, uh, but anyway, that's, that is true, and that's, that's a lot. Now, I want to say a little bit about Harvey. Uh, Harvey Goldberg, if you, I guess there aren't any videos, uh, but there's audios of his lectures. Um, he was astounding, and I, I'm choosing my words carefully, and I'm not being hyperbolic. He was truly astounding. I've never encountered anybody like him as a, as a speaker, as a lecturer, and everyone else that I know that took his classes says the same thing. Um, uh, he was, first of all, profound, uh, so we start there. Um, he was profound, he was engaged uh, politically, deeply engaged politically, and yes, uh, he was mesmerizing. Uh, so he had this unbelievable uh, style as a lecturer that I have, um, I could do my imitation here, but I'm, I'm not going to try. Uh, he, he had this unique style, it was, um, it was uh, no doubt part a show but it didn't seem like a show. It was Harvey conveying to us his passion, his ideas, his way of thinking, his commitment to rigor, all of, the, all of those things. And Harvey was a leftist, uh, unapologetic leftist, uh, and he was uh, very committed to it. He was very open to it, and he, um, he made no bones about it in his lectures. So, uh, no doubt the, the chancellors at the time would get uh, complaints from parents saying you have a biased professor who's speaking in front of all these students and is, and is giving out leftist uh, propaganda. And uh, I know that happened. He told us that happened. But he, he said what he believed and he backed up what he said with, with research. And that was, uh, that was Harvey. Uh, so. Uh, at that time, uh, being a leftist, uh, he, was, um, he said nice things about socialism. He said nice things. Uh, not, he was very critical of the Soviet Union. He said, he said there were some good things. He certainly said there were, there were a lot of good things to learn from the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. He taught us that. We learned about uh, Maoism, and he had a lot of positive things and critical things to say about Maoism. He had a lot of uh, criticisms of capitalism, U.S. capitalism. That was all. That was the mix, and that's what got the 500 students in there. Because he, he would tell, tell, he would teach us about uh, the world from his leftist perspective, but he did it in a way that was was rigorous, and it forced us to not just adhere to an ideology or or a, a political stance, but to understand that if you if you're committed to a political position. You can't just have a political position. You have to fight for it intellectually. You have to be deeply committed to research and understanding uh, how one thinks about the world. And most importantly, he, in what leftism meant for Harvey was not, uh, he was not, he didn't particularly care about a, any political party or any country. He was not just out defending the Soviet Union or China or Cuba. Uh, his commitment was to uh, working people and the poor, and that applied to every country. And so that's what he uh, conveyed to us, and that was the fundamental thing that, you know, uh, what is it, how does a society treat the working people? What is it doing to uh, improve lives for the most vulnerable people? And how can we think about that in a rigorous way and have passion about that, but also have a serious commitment to doing something about it. That was what drew the 500 people to every lecture. And uh, in my own case, uh, not only was I fortunate to have had uh, two or three lecture classes with him, two, I think, but uh, in the, at the end of my junior year, Harvey announced to 500 people that he said, I'm tired of giving these massive lectures. And that was part of the theater. He wasn't really tired. He, he wanted to take a break, but he also didn't mind everyone saying, no, Harvey, no, no. Uh, so, uh, but he did for w the next year, he said, I'm going to teach a small seminar. And I was lucky enough that I got to take his seminar. 
So I did my senior thesis under Harvey, and Harvey uh, told me what I should do my senior thesis on, which was on the, um, the uh, closing of the Gishold uh, machine tool factory here in Madison. And so he said, you know, this is contemporary history. We're learning about uh, the impact of uh, deindustrialization, or although I, I don't think we had that term then, um, in Madison among our community. And he said, so you go out and talk to the workers. And that's, that was it. That's what I did. And he said, now before you do that, you need to learn something about uh, the machine tool industry. You need to learn something about Gishold. You need to learn about the global forces that are operating that affect people in our community. And then you need to learn something about doing oral history, which I, I didn't even know there was such a thing as oral history. So that's what I did. And yeah, so my senior thesis under Harvey was the shutdown at Gishold, the workers speak. And uh, I, I forgot to check, but I think my tapes were deposited at the Historical Society. So I'm going to, when I get time, I'm going to check again. OK, so that's by way of background. Now, Jim asked me this morning, or at lunch today, he said, well, how do you get from being an undergraduate student in history and Madison to talking about the green economy? And uh, my answer is, uh, I, don't see any trans I don't see any transition at all, really, other than that it's kind of changing the particular focus. But in terms of the, uh, the, the, the way of going about it and uh, thinking about it in a way that uh, addresses our ecological crisis and doing it in a way that is focused on the well-being of working people and the poor, that's, it's the same project. It's almost as if, I feel like it's almost as if Harvey is, is still supervising the project because it's, it's very much in that spirit. Uh, so the, the, the project that I've been working on now for several years is precisely to think about uh, of course, the necessity of a uh, green uh, energy transition. And more precisely, as I'm going to show you, and yes, yes, I, I am an economist, so I am going to show you a bunch of numbers. Uh, so I want to be very precise and say, here's what the green energy transformation needs to be in terms of hitting emission reduction targets. And then I'm going to say, in doing that, what is the impact on, on working people? And, uh, because the, the issue, including in Tuesday's election, from my own reading of the press and watching uh, you know, the, the returns Tuesday night, is th this notion that uh, investing in a green economy and taking climate change seriously um, is going to be bad for workers in the United States. So that's when you know, I heard uh, um, Mitch McConnell, I mean, what's the first thing they said? Well, we're going to build the, the uh, Keystone Pipeline now. So, and what's going on there? That is, you stop talking about uh, climate change. We've got to worry about jobs. So my project uh, on this from day one has always been, uh, can we talk about controlling climate change in a way that's also good for jobs? That's, and I took that as a question. Of course, I had my bias in terms of what I wanted the answer to be, uh, but I also uh, I subjected it to uh, the, a res it was a research problem and a question. So basically, I'm going to give you my answer. And by the way, uh, feel free to raise questions, comments, interrupt, denounce anytime, which is something Harvey would never do, by the way. A couple times when people actually did interrupt his performances, uh, to ask him maybe a slightly aggressive question. Um, he didn't seem to like it that much. But uh, we, we live in a more democratic era. Uh, OK, so as I said, I'm going to start out. Uh, when I talk about a, um, a green energy transformation and a, and a global, it is a global problem. I'm going to focus on the US, but it is a, it's, obviously it's a global problem. You know. CO2 emissions or CO2 emissions, no matter what country they come from. And if you want to uh, later get into some issues around other countries, I'd be very happy to do that. 
uh, as, as Jim uh, was nice enough to mention, I have this big study from, uh, that I did with the UN on the global framework, but I'm going to focus mainly on the U.S. now. But uh, what do we actually mean when we say uh, we have a, a climate crisis and what do we mean about controlling climate change? And so I'm going to try to be very, very precise about it. Uh, by the way, I, I, have, I make absolutely no claims to being a climate scientist. So I'm working from, in terms of the uh, need for reduction in uh, emissions, I'm working from the basically what I take to be the scientific consensus from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. So I'm, that's my starting point. So uh, here we go. So total greenhouse gas emissions in the global today are 45 billion tons. It's 45 billion metric tons, but we'll just say tons. Uh, so it's uh, what the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, tells us is that in order to achieve climate stabilization uh, over the next 40 years, roughly, here's what we need to do. We need to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 80 percent by 2050. 80 percent. So that means we're at 45 billion tons now, and we need to be at 9 billion tons. That's, that's an absolute decline, not a rate of reduction of an increase, an absolute decline. And we have an intermediate target from the IPCC, which is we need a 40 percent reduction, they say by 2030, but you know, as, as Jim, I think, said, I, I started the work four years, it's taken me four years to finish this, and so 2030 is a lot closer than it was four years ago. 2030 is only 15 and, uh, uh, 15 and two months, or 15 and one and a half months away. So I'm going to say, just to be realistic, I'm going to say 20 years. We have to hit a target within 20 years, so more like uh, 2034. We need to get uh, down by 40 percent in absolute terms. Okay, now that's total greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, of total emissions, roughly 80 percent are, are uh, energy-based emissions. So 72 percent are CO2 emissions from energy sources. So what does that mean? It means burning coal, burning oil, burning natural gas. Seventy-five percent of all emissions are burning coal, burning uh, oil, and burning natural gas. So, so, you know, look, we can see all those beautiful commercials that Exxon and Mobil put on TV about how all, they're, all they're doing, but basically what we're saying is by 2050, they're kind of out of business unless they start doing an entirely different business. We can't keep burning fossil fuels. We just can't. If you take climate science seriously. The option is to not take it seriously. The, it could be, by the way, that they're wrong. Could be they're totally wrong. I'm just not willing to bet on that. Okay, so uh, CO2 emissions from energy sources are 75 percent. And then another 7 percent are, are methane and, and nitric, uh, nitric oxide uh, from burning and, and uh, mining energy. So 80 percent of the problem is the way uh, we extract and then burn fossil fuels. So I'm going to focus on uh, reducing CO2 emissions from energy sources. 20 percent of the story is basically methane uh, from, other th from agriculture and from deforestation. That's a, that's a very important part of the story. That's 20 percent of the story. So I'm going to focus on the 80 percent of the story. Okay, now uh, it's not going to all be all these numbers, but uh, I, I think it's really important to try to be precise. And I've tried to make it simple. A lot, a lot of the discussion, and it drives me crazy, is you get these discussions about Number, you don't have numbers, you have percentages off of benchmarks, like X percent off of from 2005 or X percent off of 1990. And, you know, people spend so much time to trying to figure out which benchmark you're supposed to remember. 
uh, and it's just, it be, it just totally confusing. So I'm saying, let's think about the numbers, the absolute numbers, and who cares what the benchmark is. Uh, so, in terms of CO2 emissions, uh, we're at 33.6 billion tons, and we need to get to 20 billion tons. So 33.6 to 20 billion tons within 20 years. Now let's express it in simpler terms, uh, per person. In the globe today, uh, emissions, every person emits about, on average, 4.6 tons per year. And in 20 years, that has to be 2.4 tons, taking account of population growth. Now what about the United States? United States emissions now are 5.7 billion CO2, okay? So it's about 17% of the globe. So we are not the whole problem. Even U.S. And, and China are not the whole problem. U.S. and China are 40% of the problem. That's a lot, but 60% is every, every other country. Now, what about per person? U.S. per person, on average, uh, emits 18 tons of CO2 per person per year. Uh, and we need to get that to a little less than 11 tons. Okay, an absolute decline not a reduction in growth. And so the challenge is how do you do this uh, in a way that does not destroy jobs, does not destroy communities, does not pe leaving people feel worse off? Because we can preach all we want uh, to people, okay, you know, the crisis is ecological and everything else doesn't matter. You may believe that. You may be willing to com completely reduce, you know, if you're at 18, tons of emissions and you say, I'm going to get down to zero, I'm going to do everything it takes. There are some people like that and I admire them. I happen to not be one of them uh, and I don't think very many of us are. And I don't think that we actually are going to uh, stabilize the climate if we count on people doing that. So the alternative is to say, is there a way through which we can achieve our emission reduction target while maintaining or enhancing average living standards. And of course it's true in the United States. It's even more true in other countries. Having done work on a global scale on this, having spoken at global meetings, uh, I can't with, uh, in good conscience tell people, for example, from Indonesia, uh, your emissions per capita now is one, uh, 1.7 tons. Mine is, my average is 18. You need to cut. Uh, or at the very least, you, you can't go up. You just can't. Uh, so that's not a very persuasive story. I don't even think it's an ethical story. And so, right, so we have these, we have like the debate around the Keystone Pipeline. And we have the debate, uh, as you know, we saw from the elections on Tuesday. In Kentucky and West Virginia, I saw a uh, senator on TV, I'd never heard of him, and he was saying, well, President Obama is finally going to get the message that, you know, we uh, mine coal in West Virginia, and we mine the best coal, and we're keeping this economy going, and uh, our coal is the cleanest coal. Of course, it's not true, but uh, uh, anyway, he, he turned out to be a Democrat. Uh, yes, yeah, so I said, wow, uh, let's wait to hear when the Republican comes on. So. Uh, I mean, these are really, really, really serious issues, and we've got, if we're going to build a viable program that's a clean energy, a green energy transformation, we have to take these questions seriously. And like I said, if you're talking about India, if you're talking about China, if you're talking about South Africa, if you're talking about Indonesia, if you're talking about any developing country, you cannot in good conscience say, you stop, no, no, you can't have coal. We get to have coal. You can't have coal. Uh, you know, you all can't grow. We already grew. It's, it's just, it's not, it's not going to happen. Even if, you even if you believe in it as an ethical position, uh, it, it's not an ethical position from their standpoint. And even if you thought you could convince people in West Virginia or in India of this, your ethical position, Let's face it, it's going to take 25 years to win that debate, and by that time, the Earth would have burned up. 
So we have to come up with a better approach. And that's kind of uh, what I'm trying to get at here. Now, how serious is the challenge? I want to just report to you the figures from, there are basically two gigantic global energy models where, you know, they take into account everything, economic growth, uh, energy mix, energy prices, and so forth. And then they come up with uh, what they call their reference cases, which is what they expect to happen over time. The most likely scenario over time. And the two are, one's from the U.S. Department of Energy and one is from the International Energy Agency uh, out of Europe. Okay, so here are the reference cases, the most likely scenarios that both of them come up with. Well, we, maybe we can take, uh, we, we can take a little bit of uh, solace from the fact that at least they're the same. So, it, you know, what they're telling us they think is, that this, it's kind of the same story. Now that's the good news, not very good news. Here's the other news. They both say that if the world pretty much proceeds as we are now, uh, we are going to be at 41 billion tons of CO2 emissions in 2030. 41 billion. Do you remember the number I said, the target? 20. Now, I may be the only person that actually reads these documents. You know, they're like this. Um, and it's not like they say on page one, we've got a real problem here, you know, uh, we're not even coming close to hitting the emission target. No, the, these numbers, they're there, and they're buried on page 417, and you know, I've got to put on like my super reading glasses to read them. I, th th this is literally true. Uh, you can, it's just in there, it's in there with everything else, you know, like, I don't know, you know, what is their prediction for the, for the price of uh, natural gas in 2030 if you have 35% fracking and 65% traditional mining? You know, so it's just like all in there, but nevertheless it's there. So in both cases, the two models, the two global models of what uh, is going to happen over the next 16 years, both tell us that there is no chance whatsoever that we are going to hit the emission reduction target set by the IPCC. None. We're going to miss by 105%. That's what both of them are telling us. That's where we are. That's if the world more or less proceeds along the path we're in now. Now, the International, Agency, International Energy Agency does also give us a couple of other scenarios. And they have one that they call their, quote, low carbon scenario. And they lay out pol global policies uh, that will, they say, is the most aggressive case that they can imagine occurring uh, through 2030, and then they have it to, through 2035 and so forth. Now, even in that case, even in the, the most aggressive scenario that they can think of, according to the International Energy Agency, we're, in 2030, we're going to be at 24 billion tons. So we are going to miss the target by 20%. This is the target. We're going to miss the target by 20% under the most aggressive case that the biggest agency studying this says is feasible. They themselves even say, under their most aggressive case, and again, this is also buried on page 617, and I'm only exaggerating slightly, they say that under their most aggressive case, their low carbon scenario, uh, which they think probably won't happen, uh, there's a 50% chance of achieving climate stabilization under their most aggressive case. So uh, what is that telling us? That's saying that, uh, again, if you take climate science seriously, uh, if you think they really are describing something that could actually happen, uh, that we are facing the, uh, a high probability of uh, a, a massive ecological uh, um, uh, disruption. And I'm trying to understate it the way I'm saying it now. Um, that is, uh, there is a very high probability that the uh, phenomena that we're observing in terms of uh, ecological uh, anomalies at this point, in terms of droughts, in terms of temperature, in terms of 
uh, uh, water levels, in terms of floods, uh, all of those things are uh, very likely to only intensify, uh, given the patterns that we see. And even given the most likely, uh, I mean the most aggressive scenario that, we, that the International Energy Agency that can come up with. If you ever, if you re go read the document, it's all in there. It's, they don't make a big deal out of it, it's there. Okay, now <laughs> that's, uh, that's the grim picture. Now here's an alternative, and this is the thing I want to uh, focus on, is uh, I actually think uh, the problem is uh, s solvable. Um, it is not that hard to think about the solution analytically, getting the politics right is of course the massive problem. But what is the, uh, what is the uh, approach? And um, I guess because I, I didn't come at this uh, from the standpoint, I, I'm not an expert in environmental science, I'm not an expert in environmental economics. Uh, my area is basically macroeconomics, industrial policy, jobs, finance, and so that's how I came into this and I thought, well, from the standpoint of these, the ways of thinking, it just doesn't seem like it should be that hard to solve. And here's why. Uh, if you think of a simple analogy, which is the role of military spending in the U.S. economy. As we know, the massive increase in military spending uh, after uh, Pearl Harbor uh, uh, led, uh, ended the Great Depression, completely ended the Great Depression. Uh, U.S. unemployment went from 13.2% uh, to 1.3% in one year uh, after Pearl Harbor and after the U.S. committed to building uh, the uh, military up rapidly. Um, moreover, in the, certainly in the uh, tradition of, of uh, well, I, I want to say uh, radical economics, but it's not only radical economics. Uh, the tradition of understanding industrial policy in the United States, um, the role of military spending as a source of innovation and job creation is really, um, it's really not in dispute. Uh, so, for example, talking about a, a non-radical economist, his name is Vernon Rutan, who was at the University of Minnesota until his death, wrote a book called um, is war necessary for economic growth? This was his last book before he died. And uh, his answer was yes. Now, if you read the book, he was being provocative, of course. Uh, if you read the book, it wasn't war that was necessary for economic growth. It was industrial policy, an industrial policy that happened to be focused on the military. And it was this industrial policy that drove innovation, that uh, that created, um, among other minor innovations, according to him, uh, the jet, en jet engine, uh, the computer, and the internet. Uh, all came out of military spending in the United States. And uh, if you read in the radical tradition, uh, the great work of uh, uh, Paul Sweezy and Paul Baran called Monopoly Capital, they said military spending was the most important prop against long-term stagnation in U.S. capitalism. So uh, for me, I was thinking when I, I was hearing about you know, the, this notion that you cannot uh, invest in a green economy uh, or, or you can, um, but controlling the environmental problems means massive job losses and there's just no, there's no way of avoiding these trade-offs. And that's what the story about the uh, the pipeline is about the Keystone Pipeline. That's a story about uh, Kentucky. That's, a, that's the debate that's out there this week. Um, but if you think about it as analogous, if you say, well, it doesn't have to be military spending. Why can't we invest in building a green economy? You get the same benefits as we'll see. You get better benefits in terms of jobs. You get better benefits in terms of innovation. And guess what? You can also control climate change. So that was kind of the starting point for my own research. And uh, there are trade-offs. Uh, there are certainly impacts on specific regions and communities. 
So Jim mentioned this study I just uh, put out last month with the Center for American Progress, which is a think tank in Washington that's uh, close to the um, Democratic Party. I just put it out. And as I told Jim, uh, it took four years. One year, with the last year was fighting with the Center for American Progress uh, about what I could say and couldn't say. And in the end, I said everything I wanted to say. Um, I threw in a few things that they wanted that hopefully no one will ever read. Uh, but uh, one of the things they kept telling me is, you can't say that coal miners are going to lose their jobs. I said, well, it's true. Uh, they said, no, but we don't want to say that. I said, yeah, but then if you don't say it, everyone's going to know you're lying. How about that? So I said, how about let's think about something else, which is, of course, coal miners are going to lose their jobs, and of course, it's going to be hard on those communities, but let's think about some serious transitional policies. So that was the way I, I came at it, and that's kind of that's the basic approach. So uh, there is, uh, here's my solution right here. So we're going to say there's two simple things to do. They're simple and they're not simple. Conceptually, they're very simple. The first thing is invest in energy efficiency. Right now, uh, the U.S. Uh, consumes all energy from all energy sources. We consume about 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy from all sources. It's a little less, but nice round number. What's a quadrillion BTU? If you, got, if you started in my house in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, and drove to Los Angeles and back, and then you did it 62 million times, that's one quadrillion BTU. Uh, OK, so that's uh, one way to think about it. Another one is if you wanted to pile up, uh, how much coal would you burn with one quadrillion BTU? So think of a rail car. And the rail car starts in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, and ends in Anchorage, Alaska. And then you think of a rail car with all, all of it is piled up with coal, and you burn it. That's one quadrillion BTU. OK, so we uh, consume about 100 now. We need to get it down to 70. We need an absolute cut of 30% uh, in uh, energy consumption. And I'm going to say that the way we do that is by making things more efficient, not by, for the most part, asking people to stop driving their cars, turn off their air conditioners, don't take any trips. Uh, I'm saying we can do that. I'm saying this building right here could become roughly 30% more efficient uh, very easily. And probably every single building on this campus. And for, for the most part, every single building uh, in the United States could become uh, uh, more energy efficient in the range of 30 to 40%. We can talk about details. I will in a minute. And then the second project is to build up uh, clean renewable energy sources. That is, invest in solar, uh, invest in wind, invest in geothermal energy, hydropower, small-scale hydropower, not gigantic dams, and uh, low emissions uh, bioenergy. Uh, by low emissions bioenergy, I do not mean uh, corn ethanol. If you burn corn ethanol, you might as well burn coal. Uh, I also don't mean burning wood and wood chips. Uh, people somehow are of the idea if they have a, uh, fern a, a stove in their um, living room and you, uh, you put wood chips in and you burn it, you're doing something that's really ecologically cool. No. Uh, you might as well burn coal. Okay. So when I say low emissions bioenergy, I mean uh, energy from uh, basically agricultural wastes. Uh, such as corn stover, such as the stalk. I mean, uh, growing switchgrass uh, in uh, low, produ low productivity uh, agricultural areas. I mean, recycling uh, grease, waste grease, things like that. OK, so uh, right now, our uh, clean bioenergy is around 3.5 quadrillion BTUs, so 3.5% of total supply. Uh, mostly uh, from hydropower and, and wind, uh, and that needs to get up to 15. So a fourfold increase. Uh, 
that's the project. The project is cut energy uh, usage absolutely to by 30 percent to 70 quadrillion BTUs and increase clean renewables by uh, uh, 12 and a half quadrillion BTUs up to 15. And if we can do that, we will hit the 20-year uh, emission target. Now, OK, so what about coal, natural gas, nuclear power, and so forth? Well, they're just going to have to go down. In 40 years, 50 years, we're just going to not burn them at all, uh, maybe 60 years. But for now, to hit the 20-year the, uh, target itself, we have to cut them by 40% in absolute terms. OK, so yes, coal miners will lose their jobs. Not a happy thing to say, but <coughs> it's the truth. Uh, so to, to hit the target, um, we need uh, coal to go down by 60%, oil to go down by 40%, and natural gas 30%. This notion that natural gas is clean and that it's a bridge fuel, that's the term, the bridge fuel. Again, the Center for American Progress wanted me to say this. And I actually convinced them over the four years that that was a falsehood. It is not a bridge fuel. It is cleaner than coal. It doesn't make it clean. Emissions per, uh, uh, per unit of energy, per uh, uh, BTU, uh, are about half in uh, nuclear uh, in natural gas that they are in coal. Okay, So that's an advantage. But we just said we, we have to get a re an absolute reduction of 40%. You can't keep burning natural gas. Let me give you uh, an exercise to illustrate this. And it, it's in, in our big fat study. So let's try this. Let's say we eliminate coal 100% <coughs> in 20 years. Implausible, won't happen, but let's just say that. And then let's just say that we substitute for every BTU that we, we eliminate from coal, uh, we do natural gas instead. So bridge fuel. What happens? Well, we miss the emission reduction target by 35%. So this is with this utterly implausible scenario. Uh, you still miss the emission reduction target by 35%. So there is no way. And so. Uh, Whatever, by the way, whatever you may think about fracking, and we can talk about that in terms of its impact on drinking water. And yeah, okay, this was a prop, of course. I plan, I plan to start coughing. And uh, um, whatever you may think about that, whatever you may think about it in terms of uh, disruption, in terms of earthquakes and all that, um, those are incredibly important issues. All I'm saying is. No matter how you extract the natural gas, if you keep burning natural gas and if you expand the natural gas industry, then there, again, there's no way you hit the target. There's just no way. It's just arithmetically impossible. There is this uh, technology, carbon capture technology, which says, OK, we have all these resources, fossil fuel resources. Yes, the CO2 is bad. What if we could just pull out the CO2? And oh, then what do we do with the CO2? Oh, you just bury it underground in perpetuity. Um, how about that technology? A lot of people take it seriously, including I was a consultant for the Department of Energy. The head of the uh, Energy Department at the time, Stephen Chu, is a Nobel Prize winning uh, a physicist and very much committed, I believe, in his own way to uh, a clean energy transformation very committed to carbon capture and sequestration technology. Uh, here's a big problem. There is no evidence that it works at all. There is no commercial scale carbon capture and sequestration uh, technology working. Um, could it work? Maybe. Uh, uh, we don't know that. You know, Maybe it'll take a trillion dollars to build it up. If we're going to spend a trillion dollars, let's spend it on something that we know is going to work, like solar energy. Besides which, carbon capture, it is, and it's the second part of it is sequestration. So we are going to be transporting all this carbon uh, 
and storing it underground. By the way, where, where are the places you store it underground? Um, that is also a problem. And store it underground in perpetuity and think that none of it ever, ever is going to get released into the air. Um, it's all implausible, and that's why I don't think it's a solution. Another possible solution is nuclear power, which uh, in generating electricity emits no emissions. That's the good news. The bad news is uh, nuclear power has demonstrated over and over again that it's not safe. Uh, the most recent case in point was 2011 Fukushima, Japan. And you can say, oh, well, they, that plant was not, uh, it wasn't well taken care of, it wasn't well regulated. Well, if we're going to increase uh, nuclear capacity tenfold, twentyfold all over the world, uh, do you think other countries are going to be uh, more vigilant than Japan is today in uh, controlling uh, the potential leakages under emergency conditions? I, I don't think it's true. On top of that, you have the problem of uh, radioactivity, um, and you also have the problem of security. I mean, do we really want there to be any potential for uh, nuclear power to fall into the hands of ISIS, for example? Um, let me just uh, quote from this, this uh, yeah, we had this forum in the uh, Boston uh, Review uh, two months ago. Uh, my article, uh, which I'm talking a lot from the, what's in that article, and there was uh, seven people who responded to the article. One of them was someone named Leslie Dewan, who's the co-founder and chief officer of Transatomic Power. If you Google her, she is a uh, really important leader in the development and application of new nuclear technologies. And she even says, uh, many nuclear engineers, myself included, were driven to their work by a commitment to environmentalism. We think developing safe nuclear technology is the best way to help the planet. Okay? No better spokesperson in behalf of nuclear technology today than Dr. Leslie Dewan. Okay, and here's what she says with respect to why nuclear energy is gotten, getting more and more safe and uh, we should embrace it. So, uh, new uh, reactor technology can produce significantly less waste or even use it as a source of fuel. Some current designs extract energy from uranium more effectively, producing only a fraction of the long-lived waste of conventional plants. Other, more exper exper experimental systems extract the energy left behind in long-lived waste, reducing its radioactive lifetime by an astonishing factor of a thousand. Fantastic news, right? And here's what she says, the rest of the sentence. By an astonishing factor of a thousand. From hundreds of thousands of years to only hundreds of years. Only hundreds of years. We've solved the problem. So if we can get by those hundreds of years, we don't have any problem of nuclear waste anymore. Absurd. And like I said, this is not some crank uh, writing a blog at 4 a.m. from somewhere. This is uh, you know, the, the, one of the leading people in the field uh, on nuclear safety. So if that's the best defense she can come up with, to me, that says there is no defense. So we have to come up with a solution uh, that does not rely on uh, carbon capture technology, that does not rely on conventional fossil fuels, and that does not rely on nuclear power. Okay, so uh, to get to where I said we have to get to with respect to um, energy efficiency and renewables, according to the research that we do in this study, we're looking at a level of investment of $200 billion a year, over 20 years. Every year, $200 billion a year, which is a huge amount of money. It's huge, $200 billion a year, okay? And it's 1.2% of U.S. GDP today, and will be a smaller percentage of U.S. GDP as U.S. GDP gets bigger. So it is a big number, but it's not a big number. Um, and, uh, when you invest in energy efficiency, um, 
the building runs more efficiently. That's the point. You recoup your investment, <coughs> depending on which particular situation, in three to five years. So these investments, it's not just sunk money. It pays for itself in three years, four years, five years, sometimes two years. Am I making this up? No. <coughs> Here's my sources. There are a lot of other sources, but for the purposes of what I'm trying to do, I use the most mainstream kind of sources, the most credible mainstream sources, including National Academy of Sciences, the US Energy Department, and McKinsey, the, the consulting firm. This is what they say. I'm using their own numbers, and I'm building this framework off of their numbers. So right now, we uh, invest about somewhere between 45 and $60 billion a year in clean renewables and energy efficiency, and we need to quadruple that number. So it's, it's not a big number in the sense 1.2% of GDP means what? It means 98.8% uh, of GDP can do everything else, kind of like not worry about the problem. But we need the 1.2%. And that means we need to quadruple our investments. Now, uh, the, as I said, the energy efficiency pays for itself. And what we're looking at here are estimates. This is a global estimate of the cost of electricity from clean renewable energy uh, relative to fossil fuels. And this gray uh, rectangle is the cost of fossil fuels in the OECD countries, in U the US, uh, Canada, uh, Western Europe, Japan, South Korea. OK? So the, here, the big picture is uh, <coughs> most of the renewable energy sources are, and th these are uh, they're expressed in dollars, but these are, you could call it cents. This is 0 0.1, so that's 10 cents, uh, 10 cents for a kilowatt of electricity. And so this is about 12 cents, this is about 5, 6 cents, OK? So uh, what we're looking at, the, the main thing I want to show you is that most of these bars, these bars are figures for alternative renewable energy sources. This is wind, this is onshore wind, this is offshore wind. This is solar uh, uh, photovoltaic PV panels, this is solar a concentrated solar power. Uh, this is alternative bioenergy sources. This is hydropower. And this is geothermal. So if you look over this whole thing, take out the solar for a minute. Uh, for the most part, what we are finding is that the costs of generating electricity from renewable sources is at rough parity on average with fossil fuels. So once you make the investments, you are not going to have to pay more. You are not going to have to pay more. Yes, you have to make the investments. And that's where we get part of the $200 billion a year. You have to build the plant. You have to put the solar panels up. You have to build the plant to make the solar panels. Once they're up, we will not see any increases in the cost of electricity. Now, yes, there are some issues. Solar. Uh, is not altogether cost competitive. You know, it just comes to the top here. Uh, the, the first number in each case is their number for 2012, actual, and their second number is 2020, projected. So just look, this is solar photovoltaic. Solar is mostly not competitive. Cheap solar is competitive, roughly, at the high end with fossil fuels. But by 2020, it's coming down a lot. And solar capacity, as it grows, the S general estimates is every time solar capacity doubles, the costs will come down by 20%. Solar capacity is minuscule now. But, so it's not hard for it to double. So solar capacity is going to keep coming down. Probably within another decade, uh, it'll be at com uh, cost competitiveness, so solar photovoltaic. Uh, the, uh, Bioenergy is cost competitive now. Not, you know, not always. Sometimes it's more expensive. But there is a wide range of places at which bioenergy, including clean bioenergy, not corn ethanol, 
uh, or burning wood, is cost competitive. Hydropower and geothermal and wind, onshore wind, are already cost competitive. So it's not that big of a stretch. So if we say invest in energy efficiency like this building, or like in 20 years every car should be at the level of efficiency of a Prius today, as a proud owner of two Priuses. Um, we can get there, and it's sa it saves money. It pays for itself in three years. Renewable power, w we can get there. You have to build the capacity, but the cost is, is within range. It, it, it's not like we're going to have to bankrupt people uh, in order to generate clean, renewable energy. No problem. Uh, yeah, so if you read this forum in the Boston Review, these uh, professors from UC San Diego said that I was engaging in magical thinking, <coughs> and that I was completely out of touch with reality. I couldn't repeat everything I, I say here, but here's a simple answer <coughs> for the United States. If we do the program I describe in 20 years, we will be at a level of emissions that Germany is today. That doesn't seem like such a stretch, right? And Germany is going to cut their emissions by 50%. That's the plan, and you know they're going to get there. Uh, so uh, that was my response to them. I mean, why should Ger the German average living standard is roughly equal to the US. Equal inequality is a lot less. Um, and in 20 years, Investing 1.2% of GDP, we can get to where Germany is today. That's what I'm talking about in terms of a program. Because they already have 40%, actually more like closer to 50%, less emissions per capita than we have today. Okay, so a couple of, this is the picture for the US. This, this shows us overall level. This is quadrillion BTUs. Um, so here's 100, where we are now. And so this, this is the actual level of energy consumption as of 2010. What this is, is what the, the uh, reference case, the uh, US Energy Department's reference case for 2030. And then I made up two other cases. This one is what I call an aggressive reference case, which is I say, let's think about all the things that Obama says he wants to do. Now, of course, that he lost the Congress, whether he's going to do them is another matter. Let's say he can do all of them, including the very aggressive. He's, do, he's got some ver, really aggressive things going. For example, um, raising fuel efficiency for cars. Uh, as you probably know, by 2025, he says the average uh, fuel efficiency level for new cars has to be 54.5 miles per gallon. Uh, right now, it's about 30. That, that is a very aggressive program. So that means that. Uh, by 2025, 20, uh, all the new cars have to be roughly where Priuses are today. Uh, so, uh, the, and uh, the idea of uh, cutting the uh, coal burning from utilities. Uh, and that's one of the other things that really got people mad in Kentucky. And he said, we're going to enforce the Clean Air Act and we're going to reduce emissions. So, uh, uh, if, you, if you follow the Obama program uh, in terms of efficiency, we we get efficiency, we get total consumption down to 94 quadrillion BTUs, but under the uh, agenda that I lay out, uh, the $100, $200 billion a year split between efficiency and renewable, so roughly 100 for efficiency, we're down to 70 quadrillion BTUs. Now, what about emissions based on the mix? If we're adding, you know, we're getting, uh, clean renewables up to 15 quadrillion BTUs out of a total of 70 consumption. Uh, this is the case. This is where we need to be. So that's, well, here it's, it's expressed in millions, but it's, it's uh, 3.2 billion tons, 3,200 million metric tons is the techie way to say it. It's 3.2 billion tons. Um, so we hit the emission target. <coughs> we do not. Here's where we are now, 5.6 billion tons. <coughs> Here's where we are in 2030 under the reference case. 
the energy department's reference case, which by the way, in some ways you can say, well, the economy's growing and actually emissions aren't increasing at all. So that's actually pretty good. Uh, if we didn't have a climate crisis, that would be pretty good. You know, that the economy's growing, there's more people, there's higher income, a lot of economic activity, and we don't increase emissions at all. Uh, yeah, that's true, except we miss the target by 80%. Now, if you take the most aggressive interpretation of everything the Obama administration is trying to do, which is what we try to be very fair, bend over backwards, you're at 4.4 billion tons. So you miss the target by 40%. That's where we are. So you have to do, you, you may not like exactly what I'm talking about, fine. Come up with another one. But you have to get below 3.2 billion tons. You have to, and this is the only way. There is no, you know, there's, there is no alternative, as, as Margaret Thatcher liked to say. Uh, there basically is, there's, you know, there's small ways that you can tell the story differently, no big ways. Okay, now what does it do to jobs? Here's the basic picture here. Investing in uh, energy efficiency and re clean renewables generates about three times more jobs per dollar of expenditure than maintaining the fossil fuel economy. So you get roughly, or you get 16.7 jobs, uh, investing in renewable energy and energy efficiency, and you get 5.3 jobs maintaining our existing fossil fuel energy infrastructure. These numbers come right out of the Department of Commerce input-output model. If you want to, if you have absolutely nothing else to do, you can uh, Google the debates I've been in with various people uh, who say I'm a complete lunatic. Um, the only problem is they never, uh, they never we're able to contradict this, these numbers, because they're right. Uh, yeah, you can call me any names or whatever you want to do, uh, but these numbers are, are right, whether they come from me or anybody else, they're right. And it has actually nothing to do with green, per se. It's that building a green economy uh, entails hiring more people than uh, maintaining a fossil fuel economy. Uh, you know, like retrofitting this building means uh, hiring a lot of construction workers. Uh, it means transportation workers. It means fewer imports. That's it. It has nothing to do with green. It just happens to be the case that in the levels of employment necessary to undertake these activities require three times more people per dollar of expenditure than uh, maintaining the fossil fuel economy. And so how does that come out in terms of a $200 billion a year program? It means that you generate 4.2 million jobs in any given year on average doing this green program. And yes, you do lose jobs. Coal miners will lose their jobs and people associated. The secretaries working in the coal mining industry, the lawyers, the accountants, all of those people are going to let get have to find other ways to earn a living. There's no question about it. So when you take that into account, you still net out 2.7 million jobs. How big is that? Well, you know, the total uh, labor force in the United States is 157 million. Uh, so 2.7 doesn't sound like that much, but here's another way to say it. If we project the labor market to, to 2030, 2.7 million jobs would mean a 1.5% reduction in the unemployment rate. So if we think about an unemployment rate at uh, 7%, uh, everything else equal about the economy, we get it down to 5.5%. That's, that's very important. That's very meaningful. We fight like hell to try to get uh, from 7% to 5.5%. Uh, unemployment is a big deal. OK, so uh, how do we do this? Um, so just real quickly, we, there's a bunch of policies. Uh, there is not one single policy that uh, is going to get this program going. It's a, it's a combination. It's a combination of things that actually are already in place. They just have to be done more effectively, more aggressively. And when I say a $200 billion program, I mean public and private investment, a combination, with 75% actually being private, 25% 
being public. And what are some of the policies? Well, uh, here, just a, a couple. Uh, the carbon cap or tax, putting a price on carbon. So you've probably heard about cap and trade. I'll talk about that in a second. But the idea that carbon emissions are bad for the environment. They are costs. Uh, we need to either tax those costs or put absolute limits, like California now has a carbon cap, that utilities are not allowed. They have to reduce their carbon emissions by 3% a year, or else Jerry Brown's going to put them in jail, uh, or some variation of that. And that's, that's what we mean. And when that happens, of course, it limits the supply of fossil fuel energy, and it will raise the price of fossil fuel energy. So that's number one. Uh, the Clean Air Act, uh, this Obama administration has taken very strong stance on this recently. Uh, and they, they've caught hell, which is we're going to interpret the Clean Air Act as meaning you can't emit CO2. And therefore, you have to reduce carbon emissions. And that's the basis for you know, what's ha what happened on Tuesday in the election. People in Kentucky saying Obama's totally out of touch. Well, that's, that is a very good policy. Uh, in addition, public, we do need public uh, spending. Here's an example of public spending. How about retrofitting every single building at the University of Wisconsin-Madison? Public spending saves taxpayers money. Uh, private investment incentives, such as uh, a feed-in tariff, is a fancy way of saying that if people build renewable energy and sell it to the utility, the utility has to guarantee a price. So it's a procurement policy, uh, very similar to what happens with the Pentagon today. That, yeah, what incentivizes uh, military contractors is they have long-term contracts <coughs> at a price from which they can profit. And finally, we de definitely need policies that address the transition issues for workers and community. So here's three specific examples. Uh, number one, as I said, retrofit every single public building. Every single public building. There actually is a law on the books that was passed under George W. Bush in 2007. He signed it that said that the federal government needed to retrofit 75% of all the buildings it owns. The federal government is the biggest single landlord in the country. And they needed to do it by 2015. Well, 2015 is uh, seven weeks away. Now, let's see how they've done so far. They have done it. There's a website that actually tracks it. You, you can track it every day. Here, they, so far, they've succeeded in retrofitting 0.3%. Now, I, you've all, I'm sure there's people here that know a lot more than me about, you know, if you pass a law, like, don't you have to? Don't you have to enforce it? I don't know. It passed, and it was signed by a Republican. So let's actually enforce that law. Start there. And when you retrofit the public buildings, you will have spillover effects to the private sector. You will energize the entire retrofit market. Secondly, carbon pricing. Uh, now, you've heard about cap and trade. Here's another idea, cap and dividend. Okay, Cap and dividend means Basically, you still have the cap. You set the cap uh, for how much emissions can be generated by utilities. Um, the government gets revenue by selling the uh, rights to any emissions. And then the government uh, returns the revenues back to the people. Now, the reason for doing that is if you don't return the revenues, <coughs> the impact of the carbon price, and whether it's a tax or a cap, <coughs> the impact is going to be worse for lower income people. Why? Because lower income people uh, spend a higher proportion of their overall consumption budget on energy. So that's, you know, if we want to break down the resistance of working people to a green investment agenda, you have to do it in a way that it doesn't attack their living standard. So a cap and dividend program is a way to do it. And the model uh, for doing it actually comes from the ultra-left state of Alaska, uh, where they actually have 
the, the revenues generated by oil extraction in Alaska are returned equally to the citizens of Alaska. They are understood that they own the resource and they get the revenue. So that would be the similar type of approach. Finally, when we're talking about workers and communities, the late great labor leader Tony Mazaki came up with the phrase, a super fund for workers. He was a visionary in that he uh, tried to merge, uh, he, he was the uh, secretary treasurer of the oil, uh, atomic oil and chemical workers union, and, but he was very committed around environmental issues as well as the well-being of the workers in his union and more generally. And he said, you know, we have a super fund for dirt. That's the uh, a super fund, it was the money set aside uh, for reclamation of uh, land that, uh, you know, this thing about the nuclear waste, uh, land set aside where nuclear waste were dumped. So the government created this program called the Superfund. And it was a cleanup of those sites. And that was what he called a Superfund for dirt. A Superfund for workers would say, uh, actually spend real money Coal miners will lose their jobs, communities will be hurt, uh, but invest in those workers, invest in uh, the communities, and make it palatable for these people that are in the line of fire to uh, survive and to, and to thrive and to make a transition, as we saw. That on net, there's going to be an increase in job opportunities. But you need to transition the people that are going to be hurt into the green economy. That's the super fund for workers. And that's the approach that will enable this project to move forward and to move forward in a way that is good for the environment and good for people. So I'll stop there. So comments, questions, whatever. Yeah. I think you gave the nuclear solution a brief treatment. A what? A brief, a shock treatment. Uh, the 70% uh, of electricity in France is uh, generated by nuclear power. Uh, there is, of course, the German reaction, no nuclear power in future, but that's not inspired by France, that's Fukushima or Chernobyl. How do the French solve the problem of nuclear waste? Because they haven't had an accident so far. Are we waiting for it? How do they do it? Of course nobody wants there to be an accident. But you only have to have, you know, we've only had like three, you know, we had Three Mile Island, uh, we had uh, uh, Fukushima, uh, and we had in uh, Chernobyl in Russia. And, uh, you know, the, the Fukushima case is, okay, in, this is a country that that knows about the, the hazards of nuclear energy very well. And so you could say that their, uh, you know, that their regulatory uh, environment wasn't good enough. And obviously it wasn't. But do we really expect if, for example, we're going to start building nuclear power plants in um, sub-Saharan Africa, that we're going to have better regulatory uh, systems there? I, I don't think so. Now, if we say, there is no alternative. I have a colleague in my department who says, you know, all this, you know, you need to expand nuclear power, you know, a hundredfold. Um, and I just don't think that we've solved the problem of waste. I don't think we've solved the problem of safety. And I don't think we've solved the problem of, uh, you know, the political dangers. And that therefore, France is skating on thin ice, is what I would say to that. And I think the Germans, not only the Germans, the Japanese, are now committed to eliminating nuclear energy. I think that's the right way to go. Um, yeah. Along the lines of baseline, providing baseline uh, electricity, yeah. all of the renewables going forward have these peaks and valleys, sure. right? Yeah. And also require a significant investment in relationship to the infrastructure to handle the peaks right. and valleys. Right. Uh, 200 million a billion mm -hmm. to per year. Does it handle the infrastructure? Yes, that's what it is. Yeah, including the transmission infra. No, the peak. Okay, so yes, of course, in part, 
the, the infrastructure uh, requires transmission. And yes, of course, the transmission costs are incorporated into that. Yeah, notice I didn't say zero fossil fuels. OK, so uh, fossil fuels, if we say in the, in the United States, I'm saying in 20 years we need to be at 70 quadrillion BTUs. And I'm saying clean renewables are 15. So uh, that means 55, I'm saying 55 are still uh, non-renewables, including nuclear. I'm just saying nuclear, I don't want to expand nuclear. Nuclear is right now is about 8 quadrillion BTUs. I'm saying keep it at 8. And I'm saying, yeah, the rest is oil, coal, and natural gas. And so that's where we are for the next 20 years. And we can still hit the emission target. Over time, yeah, the, the uh, management of solar and wind fluctuations will have to improve. And the Germans, are, of course, are way ahead on achieving that. They're, it's going to take a while, but it is not insoluble. So that's, yeah. Naturally, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How many people have died from nuclear accidents across the world in comparison to the number of people who have died from coal accidents and natural gas accidents? And what sort of risk are we talking about? Well, I think you have an answer in mind, so uh, you tell me. I mean, I, here's, here's my, my bottom line is, uh, do we have to bear the risk? Do we have to bear the risk? Uh, most fundamentally, do we have to bear the risk of nuclear power getting into the wrong hands? Now, you could say it's like it hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's probably not going to happen. It only has to happen once. Uh, and uh, do, uh, am I willing to bear that risk? Well, if there is no alternative, then maybe, but I don't see that there is no alternative. So I would say that build this other stuff up. Again, I'm not saying eliminate nuclear power. I'm saying keep a nu nuclear power at a baseline. Nuclear power in the US today is about 8 quadrillion BTUs. Globally, it's about 25 quadrillion BTUs. I'm saying keep it there. And let's see how we do with these other things. Yeah. I want to bring the nuclear discussion home a little bit. Um, Wisconsin has no fossil fuels of its own. So everything we burn here, we import. We had an old nuclear power plant that was shut down because natural gas was close. Cheaper, and short term it looks cheaper in today's quarter by quarter economics. Um, our nuclear fleet is aging. It's disingenuous to say keep the baseline. We owe it to ourselves to do the nuclear research for the next generation, perhaps go to thorium, if we <coughs> don't develop and drive the nuclear research here. India and China will... Well, I think you have an answer in mind, so uh, you tell me. I mean, I, here's, here's my, my bottom line is, uh, do we have to bear the risk? Do we have to bear the risk, uh, most fundamentally, do we have to bear the risk of nuclear power getting into the wrong hands? Now, you could say it's like it hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's probably not going to happen. It only has to happen once. Uh, and uh, do, uh, am I willing to bear that risk? Well, if there is no alternative, then maybe, but I don't see that there is no alternative. So I would say that build this other stuff up. Again, I'm not saying eliminate nuclear power. I'm saying keep a nu nuclear power at a baseline. Nuclear power in the U.S. today is about 8 quadrillion BTUs. Globally, it's about 25 quadrillion BTUs. I'm saying keep it there. And let's see how we do with these other things. Yeah. I want to bring the nuclear discussion home a little bit. Um, Wisconsin has no fossil fuels of its own. So everything we burn here, we import. We had an old nuclear power plant that was shut down because natural gas was closed. Cheaper, and short term it looks cheaper in today's quarter by quarter economics. Um, our nuclear fleet is aging. It's disingenuous to say keep the baseline. We owe it to ourselves to do the nuclear research for the next generation, perhaps go to thorium, if we <coughs> don't develop and drive the nuclear research here. India and China will continue to build coal. It really does
doesn't matter whether we hit our targets by 2030 if we think about only what the U.S. solutions are because there's only one atmosphere and there's only one planet. Couldn't agree with you more. My agenda for India and China is uh, analogous to the one I just laid out. Huh? Yes. Yes. That doesn't mean it's right. Uh, so uh, China is also building solar uh, rapidly, and India um, India needs to commit to uh, a green transformation too. And a green transformation for India, uh, I have a paper on that also, is, is in the range of a percent and a half of GDP per year over 20 years. And I think that right now uh, India's per capita emissions is about, ours remember is 18, India's is about 1.7 tons per person per year. And uh, I think that if India invests a percent and a half of GDP in clean renewables and energy efficiency, they can stabilize their emissions at roughly 1.7 uh, tons per year um, with an economy growing at 6.5% uh, a year. That's what my paper says. So uh, could be my paper is wrong, but I think it's right. So I don't think India has to uh, assume that the only way that they can keep growing is on the basis uh, either of coal or nuclear energy. Yeah. Have, have you looked at the uh, safety issue? I mean, we know that Louisiana, with all the refineries, has the highest cancer rate in the nation. Uh, we, we, we know that, that coal has black lung problems. Uh, but we also know that the construction industry has some of the highest uh, workers' compensation rates anywhere, and ropers are particularly dangerous. So retrofitting buildings, have you looked at the, the uh, real danger to workers in, in that aspect? I know that's kind of a detail compared to the whole thesis you're presenting, but have you looked at the c comparable uh, loss of life in the fossil fuel industries versus a green uh, alternative? Well, interesting you should bring that up because at lunch uh, we were talking about my own personal life trajectory. And one of the, the thing I did actually right after I finished college here was work as a roofer, um, and assist roofer's assistant, really. And I did mention that while I worked there, uh, somebody did fall off the roof and die. So I'm, I'm aware of those problems. Have I uh, done a, a comparison in terms of these things? No, I haven't. I don't know, uh, to be fair, <laughs> to give you my honest answer. So uh, I'm you know, working on trying to solve this as a research problem. How, how you affect the public consciousness on this, I just don't know. I mean, uh, you know, when uh, in 2008, when Obama got elected, Obama and Hillary Clinton in the primaries were competing over who was more committed to, quote, green jobs. This was a major feature of their platform. And when Obama got elected and did his, uh, the stimulus program, which was $800 billion over two years, $90 billion was committed to, green to this program, green energy investments. So like 12% of the entire stimulus was about a green uh, agenda. So that was that moment. Uh, it's fair to say that we aren't in that moment right now. How do we get back to that moment? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you know, Bob. Yeah. I'd like to continue on the political vein, uh, Bob. By the way, great talk. Really interesting. Um, and you know, one of the reasons military spending became the sort of dominant form of government uh, planning for the economy and sustenance of demand was we had no opposition from elite corporate circles. Here, unfortunately, where it was a more modest, actually, program, uh, you face the energy industry, which is an extraordinarily powerful political obstacle, as we've learned uh, in this country, and especially powerful today. Um, what, I mean, this begs the question, of, of, not just of the public, but the politics here. Who, who's on our side here? Are there 
business interests that literally will organize against energy, or is it basically it's the peasantry against energy corporations? Okay. Uh, again, you probably have a better answer than me. I'll just mention one thing. Okay. Look, why why is Germany, you know, have half the emissions that we have? Uh, to, what? No, uh, f that's just factually untrue. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's two reasons, uh, uh, as I understand it. One, they do not have they do not have a fossil fuel in, they don't have fossil fuel resources, so they don't have the political resistance from a fossil fuel industry. And number two, they had a Green Party that started getting elected and got 10 percent of the vote in the 1970s when I was still a student here in Madison. Um, they were considered crazy. They were hippie, lefty hippies. They showed up in the Bundestag with you know, long hair and blue jeans and, and uh, t-shirts and, and sandals. And, but they have, they've basically won on the fundamental point of uh, co committing the country to a green agenda. Um, and it was easier for them to do it because they didn't have the massive uh, fossil fuel industry. So uh, I don't have the, the answer. Again, I do know that you know six years ago isn't that long ago. Uh, there was a very serious commitment. Now it wasn't you know explicitly that would made it easier. It wasn't anti fossil fuels. It was here's how we fight the recession, and as long as we have to fight the recession, let's do this green thing. Um, so this is something that's a political project that. I hope this contributes to, but I don't have the answer to, yeah. Thank you so much for your, your talk, it's really interesting. I, um, I, I was wondering, you were speaking earlier about one of the, invariably, one of the, the costs of this program that you lay out is that people working in fossil fuels are going to lose their jobs, but then you were also been uh, outlining this, this really exciting plan where was the 2.7 million jobs Net being jobs. created. Yeah. I, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about maybe some of the jobs that would that are that would open up that you personally think are the most exciting or um, really economically remunerative, and are the jobs that would be lost in the fossil fuels are they? How might they be reimagined? Um, in this new economic terrain. So, um, yeah, I, we actually spend a lot of time detailing that. Um, when you have three times more jobs overall in building the green economy relative to the fossil fuel, there's more jobs of every imaginable sort, is basically the answer. So there's more jobs for engineers, naturally not petroleum engineers, but solar engineers, wind engineers, there's more jobs for those people. There's more jobs for lawyers to write contracts because there's more projects. There's more jobs for secretaries. There's more jobs for truck drivers. There's more jobs for people serving lunch on construction projects. There's definitely more jobs in manufacturing and there's more jobs in construction. So across the board there's more jobs. What about wage levels? If you actually look at the average wage per worker in fossil fuels versus our green economy, the average wage per worker is higher in fossil fuels. The average wage per worker. It's about 20% higher. Does that mean that every worker that comes into the green economy is going to take a 20% wage cut? No, it does not mean that because there's going to be more jobs and in absolute terms there's more good jobs, there's more high, medium paying jobs, there's more low paying jobs. And in, in a dynamic industry, the possibility for bad jobs to become a little better through uh, better labor standards and unionization also increases, not decreases. So the, the real transition point is, and it also I was, I'm actually overstating the negative. Uh, the 2.7, the, the, the jobs that are going to get lost are not all going to be lost because we're talking about a 20 year transition. So some of the people in the uh, fossil fuel industry, they're going to retire and they're not going to be replaced. 
because the industry is going to have to contract. So is it going to be everyone's getting their pink slip saying, you're gone tomorrow? Obviously not. Um, if, even if I'm saying the industry overall is going to be cut by 40%, that still means that 60% of the jobs are still there. So, and there is going to be retirement rates. So overall, it's a very positive picture for employment. It is not a positive picture for each and every person now working in the fossil fuel industry. So, but overall, there's more high paying jobs, there's more really fun jobs, engineering, all kinds of interesting things. Uh, there's more jobs, yes, there's more jobs for roofers, a lot more jobs for roofers. There's some danger in those jobs. Uh, but uh, overall, they're pretty good jobs. Um, so that's, yeah, that's my story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wonder if you just haven't <clears throat> written a, another chapter or a section in your, uh, potentially have a, uh, be able to elaborate your, your, your argument from the hypothetical to the probable. Uh, you noted that since 2006, <clears throat> uh, the moment has passed. You noted in Germany, comparatively, the moment's still there because of the relative weight of the, 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 the carbon industry in our yeah. society. And so, I mean, I think something that may have changed has been the, the boom in U.S. energy, right. okay? The Bakken oil field, the fracking, uh, the sudden realization that we're not dependent upon foreign energy. We have our own domestic carbon resources, and therefore that's pretty clear that debate pushed out of. So, in other words, couldn't you potentially model taking, let's say, three OECD countries that don't have fossil fuel resources, Japan, South Korea, Germany, and look at their, you know, their increasing move away from nuclear towards green energy, and then take three others, China, Russia, okay, United States, and look at the countervail, and then take a, a, a kind of intervening case, the United Kingdom, which has fossil fuels, but it's declining, and as they decline, the resistance towards alternative energy is dropping and alternative sources are going up. In other words, there is a model you know, that you could, with your range of historical multivariate skills and your, uh, your economic training, could put together to actually establish some probability behind this, what is now just purely a, a hypothesis and a policy recommendation. Mm. You didn't mention my historical skills that I got here which are the most important ones. There's no question about that. Uh, sure. Uh, here's, the, here's the global picture, in, in, uh, the simple, simple global picture. Uh, the globe, overall, you know, we, we consume about 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy from all sources. The global level is 500 quadrillion BTUs. And uh, if the, I think it's reasonable to think that over the next 20 years, we can stabilize overall global consumption at 500. So flat line. And uh, then within that framework that we, again, we increase uh, clean renewables so that of the total 500, about 150 are from clean renewables, 25 from, fossil, uh, from nuclear, and then the rest, about 300 uh, quadrillion BTUs from, uh, from uh, oil, coal, and natural gas, basically. And if you do that, you do hit the global target of 20 billion tons in 20 years. Now, uh, so then what are the stories within each country? Uh, overall, the stories within each country is, you know, so I'm thinking first about devel of developing countries. You can't ask them to stay flat in terms of overall consumption. So I'm saying, overall, let's think about China, let's think about India. I mean, those are the two giants. Uh, maybe Indonesia. Uh, let's say they're going to increase consumption by 30%. And then let's say all the rich countries, and not just G Germany and Japan, but yes, the United States, uh, yes, Canada, they're going to have to cut by, as I showed, 30%. And now, what are the politics there? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> uh, but I think if you said, well, let's, I mean, as it is, if you read that Boston Review um, forum that we had, somebody, a, a really interesting person, a uh, philosopher at um, Oxford um, named Simon, um, I forgot his last name, but he, he said that my, I didn't take enough, pay enough attention to ethical issues, 
and I'm sa he's saying that I wasn't hard enough on the U.S. Uh, you know, in, in terms of demanding more. I'm saying the U.S. should cut by 40 percent. He's saying that's not fair. And he's right in an absolute sense because I'm saying the U.S. is at 18 uh, tons per person. We need to get down to 11. The world needs to get down to 2.4. So why should we be so privileged that we can be strutting around consuming at 11? I'm saying it's not fair, except that's the only realistic scenario I can think of. And I don't think we can do any better. So how do we do the politics? So if we said, OK, Germany, yes. Uh, uh, Japan, yes, but U.S., we're going to go soft because they have a strong fossil fuel lobby. Uh, Russia, forget about it. Uh, we'll, we'll never get there. So uh, anyway, that's my basic framework. Yeah. Uh, I'm focusing on food safety. Uh, so uh, will climate change have an effect on food safety? If yes, what's the effect? If, what's that? Uh, if yes, what's the effect? Food security? Uh, food safety? Three. Safety. Food safety. Food security, food safety. Yeah, yeah, very important question. So what is the effect of using uh, bioenergy on food security? Really important question. Um, here's the, uh, the basic thing. Uh, the, the, types of, the, the type of bioenergy I'm talking about is not food crops, okay? Zero food crops. Nevertheless, we are talking about agricultural products that use up land. Now, uh, some of them don't use up land because if we talk about agricultural waste like corn stover, uh, it's not taking up any more space than, the, uh, than growing the corn already is. It still is the case that, you know, corn stover is used for, for feed for animals. So yes, we do have to address that. Um, uh, secondly, um, the issue that you know the biggest source of uh, bioenergy for expansion of bioenergy, I think, is uh, switchgrass, which is growing these fast-growing grasses that don't that require very little uh, agricultural productivity. So you can use low productivity land to grow it, but you have to build it up. Now this isn't coming from me. This is coming from research. And again, the most innovative research uh, in this is coming out of Germany. Now, to your point, back to your point on Germany. Look, look at ac the actual statistics on where Germany is today and where they say they're going to be in 20 years in terms of hitting their emission targets. If you actually look like at their government documents, they have these beautiful pictures with solar panels and wind farms and so forth that we, we see all the time. What are the, really the two ways that the Germans are going to hit their target? Uh, huge uh, improvements in efficiency beyond where they already are. And number two, bioenergy. That's not what they talk about, but again, actually look at their statistics, and they are well aware of the problems of food security. And so what they are trying to do is uh, rapidly increase productivity of the non-food uh, crops and to, uh, to build up these things and to be the innovator there. And they have also established a very strong regulatory environment in terms of the uh, control of the food crops and how you undertake bioenergy that minimizes the impact on food crops. So I think, I think there is a path. It's not an easy path. But yes, it's, thank you for raising that. Uh, yeah, well, you haven't spoken yet. So kind of jumping off that point, uh, there's sort of a gallows humor, tragedy of the commons thing, I think, going on. In the world, the U.S. in particular, in regards to companies either not buying into the concept or those that do, I'm speaking from another UW-Madison uh, school, I saw a presentation from uh, uh, Monsanto. And the VP, and I challenged Tim with a question a few years back on global warming, and he didn't want to get into the weeds on causation, but he basically said we have a team we're devoting a lot of resources to creating in the next 10 years hybrid crops that will be drought resistant, flood resistant, and they're jumping past it saying, there's no political will to fix this. We're going to invest our money on mitigating the losses when the sky comes falling down. How do you, again, it kind of circles back to that political problem, but they're devoting resources 
to the concept of what you say the problem is. They're just not yeah. trying to fix it. Yeah. Yeah. Adaptation. Adaptation, uh, yes, is certainly, uh, to me, that's a, a very pessimistic uh, framework to say uh, we are going to play Russian roulette with the environment. We are going to because nobody cares. We can't get enough people to care. There's just too much money in not caring. And, you know, Monsanto and Exxon can keep putting out commercials uh, that distract us. They can buy as many politicians as they want. And therefore, we, are, we, we don't know if we can actually mitigate. Uh, we have no idea. We don't, it could be that there isn't any problem at all. Uh, I don't believe that, or at least, you know, if you take the insurance principle, which says uh, invest in, in look, I, I, I haven't been in a car accident, in, uh, maybe since I was in Madison, uh, but uh, I, you know, the law says I have to have auto insurance, and, and everybody does. And uh, so uh, the probability of me getting in a car accident at this point is uh, a whole lot lower than what climate scientists are saying in terms of the ecological effects that we're going to face if we don't control climate change. So uh, yes, we are playing Russian roulette, and who knows what it really takes to mitigate. Uh, so yes, we should be thinking seriously about mitigation. But yes, while there is still a chance for stabilization, the, the, th the only thing I'm saying is that from an analytic economic standpoint, relying not on Greenpeace, though I respect Greenpeace and groups like that, I'm relying on, as I said, the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, McKinsey, um, International Energy Agency, National Academy of Sciences, uh, on and on, uh, entirely mainstream sources here. Uh, we, can, uh, we, can con we can stabilize the climate by investing roughly a percent and a half of GDP per year throughout the world. It is solvable, and it creates more jobs. It's good for jobs. Uh, it's good for communities. Uh, but uh, it has to be something that, yes, and how you generate the political will, I'm not sure. I, I did have the experience, I was telling Jim, when I first put out the first paper on this in uh, 2008, um, it, all of a sudden, like, the paper was a big deal. And that's how I got hired into the energy department to, to uh, help um, to implement the $90 billion investment program that the Obama administration had laid out. And it seemed like, okay, this, this fight has been won. Uh, except I was wrong. Uh, uh, but the, uh, you know, the political will shifted back it can shift back again. 